either. But um, Richard Tice says he's not yet retired since he's the VP of Tice Aviation and he's um, one of those people who's had an interesting path to get to where he is today. Uh, he first learned to fly in 1946, do I remember that right? Okay, 1946. And he's been involved with aviation for most of his life. As an author, he's written for many different publications, and those of you who read the little blurb in the newspaper saw the names of some of those publications. Um, he's written a book, Surprise, Surprise, which is available in our gift shop, and he has graciously agreed to sign this evening if you buy a copy or if you brought one of your own copies from home. And the proceeds from that will support the Historical Society. He's donating the profits from the books that are sold here to us, which is a great thing. Um, but he's going to talk about some early personalities who have made an impact on aviation in Salem. And they range from private citizens to military pilots, commercial test pilots, private pilots, inventors. Um, there were two companies in Salem that did a lot of aviation work, Mullins and today Tice. Um, and to share with you from his own experience um, some things that he thought you would find interesting. He and his wife Hope, and Hope is here as well, she's over in the corner, um, traveled around the world announcing, uh, around the country, announcing at different air shows. And they were eventually hired by Walt Disney Enterprises, WED Enterprises. And they worked on things like the um, air show for the opening of Epcot Center and the airport there, in um, two airports in Florida, and a lot of special events that involved flying and avionics. So in addition to researching, writing, and inventing things, he's a wonderfully engaging speaker. So Richard, without further ado. Wow. If that guy shows up, I'd like to meet him myself. <laughs> <laughs> and a galvo yet, too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much for coming out on a, down at our end of the neck of the woods. It's foggy. And uh, you don't know how I appreciate being with my kind of people. Uh, that I might know what kind of a choir I'm preaching to. How many of you are pilots? Wow. And personally, knowing some of the pilots that I do, and airport owners and so on, uh, I'm humbled by their presence. I truly am. How many wives of airplane people are here? My heart goes out to you. Um, as I speak this evening, a lot of it's going to be memory. And actually, you guys that are in aviation, a lot of these memories parallel your memories, your feelings. And each one of you that leaves the ground has a story to tell. So any one of you could be up here doing exactly the same thing I am. Um, I would like, before I get going, to mention there are going to be two more aviation events coming into this area. Uh, David, the dates we don't really know for um, Pat Williams, uh, who uh, as a Salem resident and her husband, uh, Bob Williams, was very prominent in many lives being saved when Mount St. Helens blew off. Um, he also ties into a story uh, of something called the Flying Flea. Um, you'll see how the story weaves together as we move on. Uh, then there's Frank Easton, who has very much to do with the strange little airplane called the Flying Flea. And he has an event coming up on May the 7th, Sunday, May the 7th, here at the museum. On the 6th, he'll be uh, celebrating, his family will be celebrating his 100th birthday at uh, Sebakeen Lake. And he will be with us for signature uh, signings and so on, and, uh, and some of his craft and a lot of his personal aviation materials are on file here at the museum. 
Okay, I guess that's locked away. We'll get on with it. I, uh, I was born in Salem, 1930. I actually have memories of being rocked on the front porch of our home on 826 Homewood Avenue when there were no houses built across the street, just a line of trees over there. And I still remember the hum of Pratt & Whitney engines, two of them, on DC-3 passenger aircraft that were on their way from Pittsburgh to the southeast to Cleveland and from Cleveland back to Pittsburgh. You could see the aircraft flying over the same, well it's probably been replaced, but there's an aircraft uh, light or beacon uh, just south uh, west of town and this was their their contact point. We were, we were approximately halfway the distance between the, um, the Pittsburgh airport and the Cleveland airport. And I can remember and I want to tell you that it, those planes are still flying, many of them today, the Douglas DC-3. I've had the pleasure of flying in it once and it was Mr. Keener from Salem, Ohio's transport that I was in. And uh, when at our factory we hear that familiar drone of that particular airplane going over as it might, it's everybody outside looking up. Um, my father saw to it that I had access to every airport that we could travel to, or my poor mother on vacation. <laughs> Uh, saw nothing but airports and they weren't always scheduled if we saw an airport uh, or an airplane dad followed it until it was on the ground we visited um, but with mother it was uh, don't mess with them if God wanted you to fly he'd have given you wings and um, I'm almost ashamed to tell you how I overcame that uh, because I wanted to be a uh, a, a, a son that was kind of an easy to handle, but we'll get on with that a little later. Um, my first airplane that I saw on the ground was over at uh, Newcastle Airport. There were two of them, and they were called tail draggers for a reason. They had two wheels forward and a, a spring-mounted um, uh, tail bar, or whatever you want to call it, um, behind. It wasn't a wheel and especially when they would turn on the dirt runways and grass runways they kicked up a lot of uh, exciting dust so those were my first encounter with aircraft when i got home i found a box in the basement had it in the backyard had re taken a pair of scissors put a pair of wings on it and sat in that box <laughs> and that was my airplane i must tell you as i grew up i did not go to bed I climbed each night into an aircraft and put my feet on the rudder pedals. I had the stick or the wheel and, and uh, the throttles in my hand, and that's how I went to sleep. So, um, and many of you did this that were in aviation. Um, we, uh, as far as Salem is concerned, going back in history, we have to go back to uh, 1916. 1916. At that time, the Mullins Corporation here in town <coughs> produced the very first robot controlled aircraft. Now, it wasn't controlled by uh, the um, uh, signals, electronic signals that we utilize today and wavelengths. Um, its control was if the airplane leaned to the right or was banking to the right, the pendulum, the heavy pendulum, swung to the bottom and pulled with it a, a line or cord uh, or cable that corrected the airplane and brought it back up to level flying, okay? The aircraft was designed, it was a bomber. It actually carried a few bombs in it and it would be pointed toward the German lines fired up and taken off, uh, this one from ponds and lakes and canals that might be uh, handy, and they would try to calculate the fuel supply 
so that just at the right time that they thought they would be over something worth hitting on the ground, three or four bombs would be released, and then the wings detached from the airplane so the whole thing would go down and hopefully hit something or someone that might make a kink in the enemy's lines. Isn't that something? Now, you're sitting in the only museum in not just the United States, but the world that has the artifacts from and the articles from the very first remote-powered aircraft to aircraft that have been designed and built for the U.S. military suspended above the floor in our, in our, our uh, industrial section. On the side of it, it says U.S. Navy. And so we're in the only museum that has the very first and one of the latest developments in drones in the, in the world. That's quite a distinction for this, for this library. Okay, we move on, and I do have quite a list. I'm going to forget, uh, I'm going to miss a lot of people that you know have flown, have had something to do with aircraft. I apologize. But if I were to include even this list I have, we might be here for quite some time. And David, if about um, 50 minutes from now, you would cut me off. I, I don't want to linger too long, okay? But um, it, it would take five hours to actually cover every one of you and members of your families that have had experience with aviation uh, from Salem. <clears throat> We move on to 1936, 1937, uh, just after my first experience seeing an airplane on the ground in the box I sat in, I started building model airplanes. And um, I, I, I would buy a kit, in those days what we're paying five dollars for, I paid five cents for. You, uh, the, the dime stores downtown, I was just, uh, my little nose was over their countertop all the time. But I started building model planes, but I liked to always, I always wanted to change it a little, add a little of this and that and so on. So I, I became a, an avid model builder. A little later, as I grew up, I joined the Petrol Pups. Dory Huffman and Dick Beck. Are, are those names that mean anything to any of you? Eh, they mean everything to me. <laughs> they had model shops down on State Street in Salem, Ohio. And, uh, and uh, Dick Beck, who um, had one of these model shops and were encouraging us as youngsters, ended up being a verification engineer many later years for Tice Aviation here in the area. But there's a lot of other things that weave in in that way. Um, in uh, 1938 through 1939, I was very much aware of of farms that were being used for airports or attempted airports. We had uh, Mr. Great that had the, uh, uh, he has the uh, Quaker Mule manufacturing. He manufactured the very first of these little yard tractors and so on. They came from Salem, Ohio, the Quaker Mule. One of them is right there in the shop area. And uh, Mr. Great had a uh, small airfield for a while. Um, I understand that Phyllis Field, are the Phyllis people here tonight? Anyone from? Uh, that, okay, your girl, I have attempted to call her and several times didn't get her. Um, I see Phyllis Field, we know Phil, Phyllis Field on the deeper road as a ballpark. They used to, every summer, uh, mow a strip through there, through that field, for barnstormers who would come up from Florida to do crop dusting and uh, uh, air lifting, giving rides and so on. Um, so the, um, that was one of the fields. I know that our, um, our polo field out on um, De um, Ellsworth was used many times for local pilots, especially after the war. I remember um, uh, uh, Bob Shea bought a PT-19, if that means anything to anybody, a uh, uh, surplus craft and f uh, flew off of the, uh, regularly off of the uh, polo field out there in uh, that part of town. Um, 
In 1939, the very first female uh, Dorothy McCandless of Salem, Ohio, was the very first girl or lady pilot to uh, get her license here in the area. Dorothy's uh, parents, uh, father was a, a doctor, and she actually, um, she actually um, considered a career in aviation. Uh, she also was a musician and vocalist and so on. She excelled in all these different areas, but she thought she might want to get into it, but felt that women probably did not have a place in aviation. Well, it was not the war yet. Had she hung in for just a few more years, she would have learned that she would certainly have been a ferry pilot, if not more, uh, to um, to transport and abort uh, needed aircraft to the war zone. War zone. Uh, but as far as I know, unless any of you know anything else, and please, anything you can add to any of this, um, bring it to the museum and alert them so that our files are, are updated, okay? Um, she didn't f uh, learn to fly at any field around Salem. At that, in those days, there was one field, there were two fields. There was Barber Field um, in Alliance and Miller Field. And um, uh, Russ Miller had probably a dozen students uh, in 1939 from Salem, Dorothy being the only girl. Um, but Russ Miller was, was my instructor. Um, and so as I look at the history of, of some of these, these uh, uh, incidents, I have to relate to them. Um, for instance, I, um, when I uh, learned to fly in 1930, or 1946, <clears throat> I have to tell you that uh, my mother saying, no dice, you're not flying, I kept my logbook in the lowermost drawer of my my um, my bureau in my bedroom, and I would take my bathing suit, wrap it and my flight log in a towel, and hitchhike out Route 14 to take a, my half-hour lesson at Russ Miller's field. When I came back home. I would pass Kelly's Ohio Station on the corner up here for any of you that remember that far back. And I would stop into the men's room, soak my bathing suit, bring it out, roll it up, be careful not to have it in the same level, uh, level and, and layer of my towel, and then take it home. And this is how I built my time. Um, in uh, 1946, I stopped out for a lesson, and uh, Russ Miller told me, Richard, I don't have time to fly it today. Um, run on down to Cleet Wilhelm. He's uh, a few hundred yards down the field there. He's flying some guys on the GI Bill. Uh, he'll, he'll take you around. And I thanked him, and, and I went on down. And there were two, by that time, there were two fellows in, in front of me, and so I got in line and uh, <clears throat> came to my turn. I crawled in the plane. He said, go ahead, take it around, shoot a normal landing. And I took it around, shot a normal landing. He got up. He said, take it. So I took it. <laughs> and as I was taking off, I noticed Russ Miller running down the, the side of the room. <laughs> and uh, he was waving. I, I knew. Of course, I couldn't wave back. I was thrilled to be able to fly <laughs> all by myself for the first time. And uh, what was happening on the ground, he went to uh, Cleet Wellham. Uh, did you know Cleet Forrest? Did yeah, you know Cleet? Absolutely. Like a brother. He had two airplanes at our place, and Wild Bill had three airplanes there. There you go. <laughs> okay. He said, uh, who's flying that plane? He said, I don't know. You sent him down here to me and told me. Uh, and he said, I, I have to, you were busy and I was to go around with him. He said, that kid's had three and a half hours to flight time. <laughs> but remember, 
I have been going to bed for years flying an airplane. It was also in 1946 that I, um, well, um, just roaming the airport, I saw the strangest, cutest little airplane I had ever seen in my life. And I do invite you to, after we're done, come on up and take a look at some of these things we have. This is called the Flying Flea. The Flying Flea. It's the French equivalent to the Volkswagen. <coughs> now, they, the Volkswagen, of course, Volkswagen means the people's car. The Flying Flea in French, now this was a French-designed uh, aircraft, is Poudre de Sel. And Poudre de means the louse of the air, <laughs> which translated the Flying Flea. And I'm telling you, that airplane, I watched uh, the two fellas, they were in white coveralls, they had black French ber uh, berets on, and I assumed that, just from appearance, they were French. But what this aircraft did, I was totally amazed at. It ran about 50 feet, and then jumped into the air, and almost like our power parachutes of today, just shot up into the air. I was astounded. When the aircraft made the pattern, it was way up at the end of the runway, and I figured, well, he'll go around again. He didn't. He came down much as a parachute, under control, and landed in an unbelievably short distance. I met the fella three days later through my brother-in-law, Ron Whitkey, who was personnel manager at Bliss. He took me up to uh, Damascus, and there in a garage was this little airplane. The fellow wasn't French. His name was Frank Easton, and, um, but the airplane was French. It was designed by Henry Meunier. <coughs> Henry Meunier designed the craft and wrote a book and published both the drawings and the book and a lot of people bought them and built them that shouldn't have. <laughs> and that little thing had kind of a nasty reputation right off the bat. One of the uh, fellows that to build it from a kit was Frank Easton, and he lived up in the up in the Oregon area at that particular time. He built the thing. He um, he has the most interesting story of his first flight, as you might Im imagine. But. Um, he soon learned that Henry Meunier, to escape Hitler and his activities, uh, moved to the United States and was going to start a company in the United States. Well, Frank Eason contacted him and let him know that he was one of the fellows that, uh, and he, that built one, and if he's going to have a factory, he would just love to be a part of it. Well, Frank, by that time, had also attended aviation college and had become an aircraft engineer. So, Meunier took him on, and within, within a very short time, he became demonstration pilot, test pilot, um, and um, chief engineer of that Meunier company, okay? Now, listen to how this story weaves in as we go on. Um, in 19... Um, Okay, let's hit some more people that, uh, ooh, you can't believe this because it isn't true. <laughs> when I was 10 years old, it was a short walk through the woods from Homewood, my home, into the backyard of one of the Gibsons, who on, on a bright sunny day was in her backyard, Mrs. Gibson, and I'm not sure if, if exactly which Gibson it was, but one of them, a student of Russ Miller's in a side-by-side -side Taylor craft, was flying over Mama to impress her, got a little low, went through a tree in the backyard. And then, which, which saved his life. It broke his fall, but he messed up the chicken coop like you never saw. And 
lived through it, and I understand became one of our military pilots when, when the war came along. I happily arrived not real late after, after uh, the ambulance had taken him away, and I myself, with a number of kids, left the area with souvenirs. <laughs> Mine was a strip of, of fabric, red and black, have no idea which part of the airplane it was. But I took that thing and kept it under my bed for years. I would look at it and feel it. It was really a part of one of those airplanes. One of those airplanes. Well, um, to move on. Oh, and I, have, I must tell you too that I, I'll bet you Russ Miller's the first, I, I'll bet I'm the first student to hug him <laughs> on our very first flight when he pulled me up into a stall and I mean he really put that nose up there and when it snapped down I left hold of the controls and got a hang on him. <laughs> I wonder if he would remember that today. <laughs> I remember when the war started uh, there was a uh, the Whitkey family lived on Euclid. My brother-in-law was Ron Whitkey he had a brother, Art Whipke, who uh, joined the Naval Air Force and was highly decorated for his work in the Catalina flying boat in the Far East, picking up downed pilots and uh, crews that had been shot down uh, in their missions uh, over Tokyo and over the islands and so on. Art, um, Art uh, thrilled me when he when called Mary and my sister at one time and said, uh, I'm going to be flying from California to, uh, to um, New York, and I'd like to stop through for a couple of days and see Mom and Dad, and, and my, Ron was in the service, but my sister uh, lived out on East View in North, uh, North, uh, off of North Lincoln. Said, sure, come on, I'll pick you up, and, I, and we picked him up at the Akron Airport downtown. They didn't have the Canton Akron Airport yet. That was not even a dream, I don't think, at that time. And um, Art came to Salem, and um, when he left, I rode back to Canton Akron, or back to the Akron Airport with him. This is by that big <coughs> hangar. He took me into the hangar with him while he was getting ready to go out to the ship. And when we went out to the plane, people were crawling over it like ants because it was the first Hellcat that anyone in the Navy or anywhere had ever seen. It had been manufactured and was now being transferred to, for testing. And uh, the big, big thrill was when he took off, he told Marion and uh, my sister, park up on the hill at the end of the runway here, which she did. And as a dot, we saw him taxi down the runway, come straight for us, and then shoot straight up in the air as he rolled. It was, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. Okay, um, Dick Strange, um, another brother-in-law. Um, Strange clothing store, men's clothing store here on State Street. Um, the Elsers. Um, uh, not the Elsers, uh, the, um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm getting ahead of my notes here. Um, excuse me. Um, the people that had the, um, had the Salem Air Park, help me. Um, Bud and, uh, Bud Seidner and his, and his son. Uh, but Seidner was very prominent, and they're from Salem, in the um, attempt of the government to get pilots as quickly as they could. The war was starting to hum, and they started the civil CPTP program, the Civil Pilot Training Program. And this, the local one was going to be through Youngstown State University. And... Um, uh, I went. Uh, I went with my uh, brother-in-law Dick to the top floor that all of you are familiar with. If you've been to the Memorial Building, it's where the dining room is and so on. And the Army showed uh, showed a uh, picture of the Air Force and so on. And then would sign up, which they did. Several Salem fellows 
to get into this program and start flying at, at uh, uh, Bernard Field, if that means anything, it will to some of you, in Youngstown. It's probably a uh, community center now or something like that. But, um, and that is where I had my first airplane ride in a Porter Field um, with an Elser brother who was one of the instructors up in that area during that part of the war. Uh, the airplane was silver wings, maroon body, and had a silver number five on the side of the fuselage. That became my number in life. It was my number in track. It was my number, my number. Did some racing. It was my number. So, uh, so we move on. Um, we, um, at one point, I... I'm almost ashamed to tell you why I moved to Florida. <clears throat> Not ashamed. Afraid of being attacked. <laughs> My father had, um, was living to retire and go to Fort Myers, Florida. I'd never been there. He and Mom had. And, and he said, kid, when I retire, that's where I'm going to go. Fort Myers, Florida. That's as much as I knew about it. But... Um, Dad lived within three months of getting to Fort Myers, Florida. Now here's the part I hesitate to tell you. The real decision to go down was because we had three lousy, snowless seasons in um, 55, 56, and 57. And I was a snow lover. Always loved it. Loved ice skating. Loved uh, um, just ski anything that was making snowmen, anything that was snow, still love it. But I decided since, since it, um, it isn't really winter around here anymore, I might as well go where it's summer pretty much all year. And so I moved to Fort Myers, Florida. When I, uh, when I moved down, I um, went to work for Gulf Airways. Gulf Airways had a couple of CBs, Pusher Amphibians, built uh, for land or sea. And we had a route from Fort Myers Page Field Airport to the islands, Sanibel, Captiva, and so on in through that area for any of you who have traveled down through there. One of our regular customers was Mrs. Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, she used to come down quite often and fly to their retreat out on the <coughs> on the islands. At that time, there were no causeways down there. Um, before too long, um, in Florida, I had joined the uh, experiment EAA Experimental Aircraft Association. Anyone belong to it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I um, in time. Uh, became president of Chapter 66 of uh, the uh, EAA. I um, started writing for magazines, aviation magazines. Um, I became an air show announcer. Um, and um, um, I also uh, established before too long a model airplane company down there. And um, the, the company was, was called um, the Fortress Flyers. And the reason I called it Fortress Flyers is because I was the founder and president. The pastor of our Lutheran church, Burke Stresser, was vice president. And Luella Seaholm, um, our financing lady to get us going, was our secretary treasurer. I do have a brochure around here, uh, uh, or in fact a newspaper article telling about the local company manufactures radio-controlled model airplanes and sells them worldwide. One of my flagship for the, uh, for the model airplane company, among the different models, was Frank Easton's Flying Flea. Now we have a lot of items in here that are related to Frank Easton. Um, 
when I was 18 years old, I had started doing drafting design for Frank Easton, and we have a, a drawing of the uh, particular flea that he was promoting at that time in our files upstairs. Um, and, uh, it, and we also have a number of his uh, <coughs> original scale models that are on display hanging from ceilings and so on. As you, if you were to go down the balcony in the industrial area, it explains in a, a, brack, a rack there the different aircraft you're seeing and who they belong to, what they're all about. You might find that interesting. Okay, we, um, we move on. Um, I met and married a gal on television down there <coughs> from, uh, at that time was, had been in California, in fact was sent out by California to do, uh, to do um, a commercial and I had written that commercial for a local television station and um, we, um, we started working together, well, uh, some time later, some time later. And then we uh, became air show announcers together. And we traveled uh, much of the United States and overseas. Um, in the United States, we uh, represented the Navy's Blue Angels the Army's uh, Thunderbirds, um, the Canadian Snowbirds and uh, Golden Sentinels, the Army um, uh, Parachute Team, and notables of aviation such as Bevo Howard and uh, people like that. And uh, as we traveled around, we, we, um, we would fly many times over Walt Disney World as we as we traveled from Fort Myers to St. Augustine, which was our air show headquarters, we'd go out from that point with Colonel Moser's Air Circus and so on. And we kept looking down on Walt Disney World being built, and whenever we would drive up through the area, we stopped at Walt Disney World. And um, finally, Hopi, my wife, said, you know what? We do their kind of things. Um, let's go up and see if we can't get you a job. And uh, um, so it's time that we keep them going. They can feed us for a while. She put a three-piece suit on me, did a, 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 a typing, loaded a, um, a station wagon with all kind of things, and we're off to Disney Rewind. I spent an entire day there, going around, being taken around, shown to different places. I left, had left, uh, left her behind at the um, at the uh, place they hired, called the uh, the staffing. Casting. The casting. Uh, yes, casting. It's like a, for a show, casting for a part of a show. When I got back, at the end of the day, they told me, um, "We want you to be in wed." The division is called, has three initials, W.E.D. Walter Elias Disney, his initials, and with your background in art and so on, we'd like to have you in that division, but we don't have place for you yet, because there are only 12 people that are in that division. When one transfers, dies, or retires, we want you to come in. So I go back to pick up my wife, no job. She's been hired <laughs> in the entertainment department. And so for three months, I got to take my wife to TP1, 2, or 3, which is uh, theme park entry areas, leave her there. I can't go in and uh, go off on a date of whatever my day was going to be and then pick her up at the end of the night. But w shortly after we got in there, and I became uh, part of Disney. They were getting ready to open Orlando International Airport. And they said, uh, <clears throat> we'll, we'll, um, the, the Disney people went to the uh, Wings and Wheels 
museum complex up in that area and said, do you have anyone that can build an air show for us um, for the opening of this big Epcot Center thing, or the big um, airport international program? And they said, well, you've got two people that work for you that do this, that have done this for years. And they said, we do? And they said, yeah. Well, Hopi got a call and I got a call and they um, put us on a committee called the um, Special Events Committee. And special events were even attached to the Macy Day Parade where Disney people go in who are, have expertise in these different areas and help produce different things. Um, we did this. And in our programming, we always utilized the Goodyear blimp because it was it was just amazing. So we wrote programs, all kind of aviation oriented programs. Super Bowl 18, um, the uh, the opening of this, the opening of that, and we always somewhere had the Goodyear blimp flying. I was in contact with the head of the Goodyear blimp division, Joe Hayjack. Oh. Know where he lived? Yeah. Let's find out. If you ever went to Disney, you'll notice that we always had our first name on a button. That's it. Last first name. So Joe <coughs> Hayjack always talked with Richard, who did uh, programming for for uh, Disney, and Richard talked to Joe. Um, didn't know Joe from. Mo or anybody else. One day, Joe says to me, Richard, you don't sound like you're from Florida. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm from where you are, Ohio. He said, no kidding. Where in Ohio? And I said, Salem. And he was quiet. And uh, he said, uh, where'd you live in Salem? And I said, Homewood. And he was quiet. He said, do you know who you're talking to? I said, no. Uh, Joe. <laughs> he said, I'm Joe Hayjack. I live across the street on Homewood from your mother. And when your father passed away, I rented your garage, your mom's garage, to keep my car in. <laughs> from that day on, from that day on, at, uh, at Easter time, we would get a solid chocolate blimp <laughs> in a cardboard pear tree. <laughs> okay, it's fit, they fit the song in the 12 days. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's Christmas, not yeah. Easter. Okay. <laughs> it's close enough. Same subject. Same subject. Okay, um, I'm leaving out purposely stuff because I'm also, I'm sure, running out of time. I do want to mention coffee, the coffee family. What a family. Um, they are responsible for one of our, uh, one of our pilots. Where's our, where's our coffee man? There you go. One of our pilots. You know much more about his being a B-17 bomber pilot and what do you know, he called his B-17 the coffee grinder. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand they really ground up a lot of German coffee on that end. Uh, um, these items uh, have, were, have been sketched by Salem artists. They're very, very um, authentic. They're for sale in the gift shop. We have other authors here that I want to, want to mention. I want to endorse every book in there by a local Salem author, they're wonderful. They really are, and they should be picked up. Um, much of the proceedings do come to keep this place going. I'm, I'm going to jump way ahead. <clears throat> We've uh, come back to Salem, Ohio, uh, from Connecticut, where we were, when we left Disney, we um, joined Warner Brothers and went to Connecticut. I had always wanted to retire back in Salem, Ohio. So, and all of our trips back to Salem when we got on vacation were in the middle of the dead of winter. <laughs> always did that. But um, 
we finally we finally um, moved back to Salem, and uh, I looked forward to retiring. And um, I thank my wife, and she arranged always when we when we traveled to to come back through this area. She realized how much I loved being here, and wanted to retire here, and I would have retired here. But my son went to the Beaver Air College and then founded Tice Aviation Incorporated, uh, which was a EAA uh, pretty much uh, oriented uh, company. He designed aircraft uh, for sport aviation. Uh, when he grew up, his mom and I were members of the um, Antique Air Association. And uh, so he grew up around double wingers, open cockpits, and so on. And this was his passion. Um, what, one of his very first prototypes, well, we went to Washington, D.C. Um, he had uh, uh, mentioned to Sean, if you guys have done model airplanes or anything you've done aviation-wise, in addition to what we're reading about in magazines, bring everything with you. So we took albums, we took albums that we have here that we're displaying with us, and um, we sat down, met Rick, and sat down at the conference table with he and his engineers, and um, started looking at the pictures in the book. The first picture he looks at, no. wouldn't you know, <laughs> is this. He got a real serious slant to his eyes, and he said, what did you have to do with this? And I said, well, that was my company, and I designed it and manufactured those models, and we sold them. He said, my dad bought me one of your model airplane kits. I built it and was so impressed with the, the way it flew and the, just the science of this aircraft that I wrote my dissertation for my aircraft engineer's degree based on the Flying Flea. We have in our library here the original copy. His family has a copy. We have the original uh, paper that got him his aviation degree. Um, he, uh, I look forward to his being here. We on the staff look forward to Rick Foch coming and speaking but unfortunately exactly one year ago cancer caught up with him he was a um, I don't know how old would he be honey in his f late 40s early f middle 50s maybe a young man really to have something it hit so quickly and took him so quickly that uh, of course we've we've lost him there so you see how that aeroplane of uh, Frank Eason has tied all of this together, tied all of this together. And um, it, uh, it, it just means much to me that, that Salem has endorsed and opened arms to, to these different activities that, uh, that we're, we're noted for. We're really, people know that we're on the map for this type of thing. Um, how close am I coming to do my pardon? You're fine. Am I fine? Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Sean, I, I do want to, uh, to any of you that have questions or additions or want to add, oh, Oh my goodness. I'm glad I have a little time left. Sam Keener. Amen. Ever hear of Sam Keener? Yeah. Okay. Sam Keener, let me get a picture of Sam. Sam was an industrialist here in Salem. <coughs> and uh, this is a picture of Sam. <clears throat> He'd never been in the Army, Navy, or Marines, but here he is in a uniform. He was an airplane nut. 
Uh, he had uh, been very successful monetarily. He uh, bought himself a DC-3, and um, this was uh, this was uh, during just toward the end of the war. Bought a, a surplus DC-3, and he traveled Europe, and he made had a uniform that he had made for himself. It was it was uh, powder blue, with all kind of, of hashes and so on. And um, he, um, of course, had pilots that he had hired to fly him pretty much around, all around Europe. And it was kind of comic it, it, to some of us to think that they said that every time he walked down, down the steps out of his DC-3, anyone that had any military thing to do, throw him a salute. <laughs> He'd throw him a salute back again. And only we in Salem knew he was just regular old Sam Keener. <laughs> but he wasn't regular old Sam Keener. He had he established Keener Airlines at at um, the uh, field in Youngstown. Um, and at that time, the um, the air terminal, well, the Navy or the Air Force wasn't in there back in these days. There was one small terminal, and I think it was still kind of wooden plaster. It wasn't the, the heavy structure that it is now. And one hangar. This is at Vienna Airport. And he had an airline that would, would fly you from Youngstown to Columbus. And then eventually to all points south, including, uh, I think, Tampa, St. Pete Airport, where I had the opportunity to to uh, ride in, in one of his airliners. So Sam, now here's an interesting thing. I had an occasion last Thursday, last week, to be in the building above the Five and Dime on the corner of Lundy and State. What, what, what Five and Dime was that, Murphy's? That was Murphy's. I was on the second floor of Murphy's. And there uh, in this dingy little hallway is a highly varnished door with a frosted glass window and on it in black letters it said Keener Industries. That would have been his office at least at, at uh, some place at that one time. Okay? Um, do we have Tom? Tom here, did Tom come up with you? Tom didn't make it. He did. The fog okay. scared him away. Pardon? The fog scared him away. Okay, all right. Um, again, I want to go I want to go at this time to any any kind of questions or additions that any of you have that you know something that, that might be of interest to this Salem story. Um, there are just a lot of names down through here. But as I sit here, as I stand here, and you sit there, I realize there are just, if I named one pilot, I've got to name all pilots. Because I just found out a dear friend of ours that I've known for years, never knew before, Opie, flies uh, AT-6 and, and um, what else? SNJs. SNJs. So, and these are World War II training craft. That uh, and I never knew it of him. So I'm just wondering how many more of you might have stories that would relate to Salem and be of interest. Uh, the one thing I do want to mention right now is that if you have, and I can see you have, not only children but grandchildren who might be in uh, be of uh, college age and might want to have careers in aviation of some sort. The Beaver uh, Community College has a, a program uh, that uh, is sistered with Tice Aviation and um, it is training and offering um, um, two years uh, um, degrees in unmanned pilotage. In other words, uh, pilots for these drones. Several years ago, um, the, um, the Pentagon let us know, uh, Tice Aviation, that they had plenty of drones, 
but were in desperate need of qualified drone pilots. This was for the military. Since that time, you've got pizza parlors, you've got farmers, you've got power companies all saying, hey, um, we, we can't afford real full-time helicopters flying over doing this and this and this. How about these smaller things? And so there is, there are uh, uh, accredited uh, programs that you might want to look into for a younger member of your family looking for something of worth to do. Um, the materials for those programs um, are up here on the table also. So I would, in any questions? Any addition? How am I on time? Okay. Pretty close? Was there a question over there? Yes, Forrest. I wanted to add about Frank Easton. Yes, about Frank Easton. Do it loudly. Well, he ended up doing some work over there at Taylor Craft. And of course, at Taylor Craft, they evaluated the air coop and numerous other ships. But yes. he also had to flee over there. Who all here has flown the fleet? Well, I got her in the air one time. Okay. That's enough for me. My hand warned me. My hand was always to you. <laughs> no, I was on the runway. And it was it was really because of uh, it did not have enough propeller to provide the power to get it to fly. Well, when I know the size of you, Forrest. <laughs> oh, no, wait a minute. I was just a mere pup. I was 180 pounds. When I talk, oh, okay. Now, there was another gentleman at our airport. His name was Al Easton. Yeah. And he had a T-6 or an SNJ-5 at our place. I don't know whether they were ever related or not. Then I've got to research Dorothy McCandless. Yes, Dorothy McCandless, the first married? lady pilot. Was she married to a Mr. McCandless? She, oh, she married Richard McCandless? Oh, no, no, no. Was she married? Was the Candlas a maiden name? That was her married name. name. That, that was, was her maiden name. name. That was her maiden name. Because there was a Bill McCandless, you know, at flew at our place with O.K. Brown in that steerman. And then the Cleet Wilhelm and the, 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 the twin Cessna and all those airplanes were there. I was born in 42. Okay. okay. But I remember a lot of things from 46 and on. Well, okay, but when it comes to taking the, the flea off, um, you are two and a half times my size. <laughs> Frank Easton was a very small gentleman. Yes. About 130, 135 pounds, as was C.C. Yes. Taylor. Yes. But that stuff would fly at 37 and a half horsepower. Oh, sure. What did you solo in? You never did tell us. Uh, yes, okay. What I had done is shortly after the incident I told you of three and a half hours <coughs> was go to work for Chuck Booker at, well, no, forget it. <laughs> Chuck Booker at the Alliance Airport called uh, Wh uh, Whitley Field or Whitley, Whitley Field. Field. Whitley Field, okay. I worked over there uh, with him on the racing planes and so on. And so actually I soloed out um, of a, uh, a Taylor Craft D model, the tandem instead of the BC 12D side by side. Right, and it was Russ Miller's airplane, or was it the Flying Club's airplane? Oh, it was the Flying Club's airplane. All right. Yeah, right. Because I have pictures of it. Of okay. Yeah. Well, 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 a lot of a lot of memories. A lot of memories. Was Duke uh, there at that time? Oh yeah. Was he? Now, Frank Flea, or Frank Flea. <laughs> <laughs> now, you see, now you see why I brushed my teeth this evening. <laughs> listening to Hopi talk, she said. <laughs> listening to Hopi talk with, um, with uh, who was it? Was it the house? Dan Burnt. Instead of paying attention, and I was nearby brushing my teeth, with what is it, uh, honey? It's a um, for arthritis uh, joints, and I had it next to my toothpaste thing. And I, and the first thing she said, "Good heavens, you got to speak! It's deep penetrating." Well, I did it. It hasn't set in yet, but what I was going to tell you is, Frank Eason made an attempt to take his flying flea, the original one that he had, HM-20, 
<coughs> and fly it to Oskosh, which is the center of the Experimental Aircraft Association activity. <coughs> he drifted over high grass and tumbled it. And we at Tice Aviation rebuilt it for him. We put it back, and now it is in the museum at uh, in Oskosh, the headquarters. Richard. So, uh, yes. A lot of these people don't realize that the flea had no uh, ailerons, so it was yeah. yaw only with the rudder. Yes. But that was on the stick. Okay. So the rudder was on the stick, and it was a control weight. You adjusted the wing to fly. Yes. And you yes. had not just to set it in to set yeah. the wing. Yeah. It was. And, it was and, a. And they're still flying today. And I'm just curious why someone hasn't gone and built a new one in this area, because yeah. they are a fantastic thing. Because they'll actually parachute down. Oh, it's, and then it's you just dump the nose of land. Absolutely. Um, there are there are many flying now, and probably um, some from my actual drawings that I had done work for them for two. Um, I've just been handed a photograph. Keener's flying Salem Engineering Office. Wow, a B-24 re reworked. That shows you Sam Keener was some kind of guy. He deserved a, a not a pink, what am I saying? A, a powder blue uniform. <laughs> and all the suits. Is that something? Uh, he put us on the map. There's no two ways about it. That That's fantastic. <laughs> what, what, what engine was in this fleet? Pardon? The fleet, what engine was in it? The uh, flea that uh, that was in Frank's ship is a Continental A40, 40 horsepower. Uh, they were flying uh, 24 horsepower, uh, even smaller in some of the versions of this particular thing. It has changed uh, somewhat, and um, remember Rick Foch, Dr. Rick Foch of the research lab in Washington, had come up with, and I do have some of those designs, uh, you'll have to see them sometime forced up in the uh, up in the uh, library section where Rick had redone in fact he designed one and he called it Richard's flea uh -huh. he always used to get a kick out of the fact that I, I was RJ Tice and he was RJ Foch so he uh, he did a, a, a revamp drawing which brought it to a little more standard of control surface but the main wing still still lifted we would go into that, but nobody on this section would understand. <laughs> okay, uh, yes. When I was a kid, we went every summer to Canada fishing. And one summer, Russ Miller was there and had a plane, and my dad let me get on that plane, and we landed on the water. I, I will never forget that as long as I live. I'm going That's to all I remember uh, about isn't it. That <laughs> Russ Miller is the one that uh, had sea bees after the war. Like like we were flying out of Gulf Aviation in Fort Myers, Florida. Russ uh, had one that he was flying. Now I'll tell you another story. You were lucky to be in the plane at the time you were. The first time that, that Russ Miller and his wife flew to Canada to go fishing, they flew down low over the crowd expecting them, waving and getting waves, and then they made their approach for landing. He and his wife weren't waving, but everybody on the ground was, next to the lake he was going to be landing in, because his landing gears were down. He had not retracted them to land in water. And they put on quite a show. <laughs> And he had he he beca she became disoriented, but he got her out, and they both popped to the surface. See how God loves you. My, my mother was adamant that I was not getting on that plane, and my father was just as adamant that I was. I loved it, and I've been talking about that ever since. And I was just a little kid. The first time my mother knew I had anything to do with airplanes, we stopped on our way home from Alliance, mother and dad and I, and uh, I said, uh, Dad, pull into Whitley Field. Was it Whiteley or Whitley? Whiteley. Is Whiteley Field, field is which is just past, it's still there, uh, close to the railroad overpass. Yeah, Alliance yeah. Airport. Yeah, so I, I said, stop in, I, I want to do something. 
And he was, he knew, he didn't know I flew, but he knew what would he want to do at the airport. Well, the Piper Cub, when there's one person flying it, he doesn't fly from the front seat, he flies from the back seat due to its balance set up and so on. And now the uh, Taylor Craft D model was just the opposite. You can set up front. Well, I, they figured I was going to take a ride. Now, Mother had never known I had anything to do with this. Dad suspected. They're both sitting in the car. We come out, and uh, Chuck Booker, I, I crawl into the Cub, which I'd already had many hours in by this time. And... He goes around the front. In those days, we didn't always have the starters. Well, we did, but we loved this this prop in the thing. You threw your foot out, and you twisted the prop, and it started the engine. And Chuck started that. And instead of getting in, he turned around and walked back into the hangar. And I'm sitting alone in the back seat of this airplane. In my mother's eyes, how dangerous can that be? Wonder if the thing starts to move. And it did. <laughs> and I took off. And that's how I, that's how, and isn't this funny? Hopi and I had been in the business with the air shows for, we, for years. And mother just, just fret continuously until the first time she didn't take a train from Salem to Fort Myers, Florida. She flew down. Now, she didn't want to go across the street unless she could fly. <laughs> but she did not want us with our children in that airplane. <laughs> our mom's great. We love her. Thank you so much. You've been most kind of her. couple reminders before we have our refreshments. We are here the second Tuesday of every month at 7 o'clock. It's always a great program. You're invited to join us even if you don't become members. If you'd like to become a member, it's only $20 a year. Um, and you can see the Joan or the folks in the gift shop. Gift shop will be open for shopping. Remember, if you want tickets, reservations for the Founders Day Dinner, which is April the 28th, also a Tuesday evening, see Judy. And if you want to bid on furniture, see me. And please stay and visit with us, take a look at the artifacts. And um, because many of you aren't members, you might not know, we are open every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday morning from 9 to 12 for research. And we have people here if you want to take a look at different things in the museum. And we're also open by appointment. And then we're open every Sunday from May to October, from 1 until 4. So please come back, bring your friends and family, and 